The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now, it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a nice show lined up for you today. A big story in the investment world last week was a rather scathing piece in the Wall Street Journal regarding Morningstar's popular mutual fund star rating system. The Wall Street Journal basically concluded there's no relationship between the star rating assigned to a mutual fund and that fund's future performance. In other words, just because Morningstar rates a mutual fund as a five-star fund as opposed to a one-star fund, that doesn't mean it's going to perform any better moving forward. We have a lot of thoughts on this particular topic because this really cuts to the heart of the debate over whether or not you can successfully pick funds that will outperform. And, Connor, we don't see this as a Morningstar issue, per se. We use Morningstar software and research. I actually think they do a pretty darn good job of analyzing mutual funds and ETFs. As a matter of fact, there may not be a better resource out there. However, for anyone trying to assign meaningful ratings to mutual funds with a hope that they can predict or otherwise suggest which ones may outperform, that's a very difficult, if not impossible, task. And we're going to present some numbers today that we think will back that up. The reality of the situation is nobody has a crystal ball. And if you're an investor relying on any sort of fund ratings as your primary means of selecting a fund, you're probably going to end up at least a little bit disappointed. You know, this is a pretty contentious debate because investors are looking for an edge and and you want to invest in funds that are going to perform well moving forward and nate when you when whenever you're on uh watching tv and, and you come across mutual fund ads they almost undoubtedly mention the handful of five-star funds that particular company might have it's a surprise if they don't mention the morning star yes and then we've all seen the names in the commercials hancock fidelity franklin templeton you name it it's a big deal to them when they get one of these five-star rankings. And the reason is is it, be, is, is it comes back to human nature. You know, would you rather go to a five-star restaurant or a one-star restaurant? Would you rather go to a five-star hotel or a one-star hotel? And that's the mentality of consumers. You want what is nicer, right? You want the best option that's out there. And because Morningstar is such a big name, really they're truly the dominant player in the fun research space and it's not really close for, for whoever's behind them. We meant, we use their research in-house. We, we are huge fans of Morningstar. But the problem is that this star rating mentality, that, that doesn't always translate into the investment world. And that's the main issue. Yeah, and we're going to get pretty in-depth on this topic today. And our hope is when you see the next commercial touting a five-star mutual fund rating, you'll at least take it with a grain of salt. Doesn't mean you have to ignore the rating, but we don't think you should view it like you might view, uh, to your point, Connor, a five-star restaurant or a five-star hotel. Now, later in the show, we'll have a, a quick market update. And then we have a wonderful guest joining us today, Stephen Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes. He's going to spotlight the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF. And if you're not familiar with the technology startup scene in Israel, you're in for a real treat with this conversation. Uh, Israel actually has more startups per capita than any other nation. And the country has been compared to Silicon Valley in terms of their technological innovation. Uh, Connor, just to wet your beak a little on this topic, I pulled a great clip from 60 Minutes. This is a, a couple years old. But this is uh, an Israeli tech entrepreneur explaining why Tel Aviv is such a hub of innovation. Tel Aviv, the startup city, 
has more high-tech startup companies than anywhere outside Silicon Valley. It is so far ahead of the curve, you can barely see the end of it. Why does Israel have so many startups? Well, some people say it's because of the military. Some people say it's because of the universities, the level of education. Some people say it's because of the level of technology. What do you say? I say it's a cultural phenomena, and the secret sauce behind it is the Jewish mother. Every startup kid here has a Jewish mother, which drive him crazy, which will push them and challenge them and inspire them. Obviously, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek response from, from the interview there. But, look, Israel is in, obviously, a hotbed, right? Stuck in the middle of the Middle East and in fairly constant conflict. And one of the, um, one of the results or re, uh, realities of daily life there is uh, required military service. And the country has mandatory conscription for ages uh, for citizens starting at age 21. That's three years for males and, and usually two years for me for females. And I really do think this is driving um, what is a very unique cultural phenomenon, like like the gentleman said in the 60 Minutes clip, because a lot of things end up happening from this required military service. The first is this results in lifelong connections that would not other have otherwise been made between you know, people that are serving. And the Israeli military is very high tech, uh, generally speaking. It wasn't shown in that clip, but the story also referenced how their military focuses on raising soldiers that are very independent thinkers, that they're not blindly following orders from their superiors, but they have to think on their feet on the ground. And a lot of responsibility is held even by the by the lowest ranking soldiers. And actually, Nate, kind of preparing for the show, I came across an article in Forbes that was just last month, and it was titled The Soldier Founder, a look at the Israeli Defense Force's perfected recipe for leadership. And the article was fascinating. It was a deep dive on the on the culture of the IDF and how all of these different forces have resulted in so many entrepreneurs and tech companies coming out of Israel. So it, it really is a unique combination of factors that has resulted in this environment that promotes entrepreneurship and quite a bit, like you said, more tech uh, companies out of anywhere besides Silicon Valley in the world. Yeah, so stick around because this should be a fun and I think really insightful conversation with Stephen Schoenfeld. He knows the space as well as anyone. And again, we'll also spotlight that Blue Star Israel Tech ETF as well. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can email us at advice at etfstore.com, or you can hit us up on Twitter, at etfstore. All right, so let's talk about this piece in the Wall Street Journal last week. It was titled, The Morning Star Mirage. And the Wall Street Journal laid out how millions of investors place their trust in Morningstar to help them select the best mutual funds. And I'm guessing you're probably familiar with the star rating system, but if you're not, Morningstar rates funds from one to five stars based on past performance adjusted for the risk of the funds and any loads. And like you mentioned, Connor, these ratings tend to be featured rather prominently by mutual fund companies. It's certainly a sales point that they use. And the Wall Street Journal had what I thought was a really good analogy in terms of how investors uh, may view these ratings. They said it's really no different than how you might use Amazon's ratings to select the best products, right? Before you buy something on Amazon, you look at the star ratings. And there are definitely some similarities here with how investors use Morningstar's ratings to select mutual funds. Well, what the Wall Street Journal concluded was that Morningstar's rating system is a poor guide to the future performance of a mutual fund. They analyzed thousands of funds going back to 2003. And I'll read you a few of the money lines here from the article. Quote, funds that earned high star ratings attracted the vast majority of investor dollars. Most of them failed to perform. Of funds awarded a coveted five-star overall rating, only 12% did well enough over the next five years to earn a top rating for that period. 10% performed so poorly they were branded with a rock-bottom one-star rating. And then they also said, quote, for all of the measured periods, three, five, and 10 years, 
five-star domestic equity funds were more likely to turn in a one-star performance than a top one. Boy, it's it just that just illustrates how challenging of a situation this is because Morningstar is such a big a big name, and they they truly do employ some of the best analysts in the world. But the flip side of that is is how much water and weight their recommendations carry, right? Because if a fund does get a five star rating, money absolutely flows into it. That same journal article, Nate, that you referenced. Uh, found that investors put new money into five-star funds in 69% of the months that they held that rating, compared with 29% of months for the one-star funds. So that's almost two and a half, three times as much fund flows going into a five-star compared to a one-star. And one-star ratings, frankly, for some funds can be a death sentence, right? So there's a lot of responsibility on Morningstar when these ratings do come out. Look, we all agree that performing analysis on funds is obviously better than not performing it, but it really comes down to the, this ranking system. And one one of the negativities of, of this ranking system is actually it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that when you get a five-star fund, the fund flows that come into it inherently make that manager's job more difficult. Let me give you a very oversimplified uh, example here. Let's say a fund manager um, has a nice small fund. They're doing very well, and they get a five-star ranking. And right now, he or she owns 50 of his of his best ideas, and they're doing fairly well uh, doing that. Well, a new five-star ranking comes out. Funds just flow into this. New money flows into this fund, and that investor has to has to invest it. So now, instead of owning, you know, his or her top 50 ideas. They now have to own the, the top 80 and then the top 100 and then top 150. And the reality is there is an inherent conflict of interest in the mutual fund model because more assets mean more money for the mutual fund company. That's what they want. But very often there's a direct correlation with as funds get larger and larger that it results in a less positive outcome for fund investors most of the time. And, you know, the whole, the whole discussion, Nate, really boils down to this. The answer to the issue about these Morningstar rankings and, and the problems they, they present for investors is nobody can accurately, accurately predict the future performance of mutual funds, not even the best fund comp- analyst company in the world, which is undoubtedly Morningstar. Well, well, let's talk more about that because I think that's the key to this whole discussion here. Uh, There are some excellent resources that I think paint the challenge here. And I'll start with one from Morningstar themselves. They put together a report called the Active Passive Barometer. This measures the performance of active funds versus passive funds, net of fees. And in their most recent report in August, their first key takeaway was, quote, actively managed funds have failed to survive and beat their benchmarks, especially over longer time horizons. And they broke down performance by category. For example, in the U.S. large cap active fund space, they found less than half of funds that existed in this category 15 years ago even survived. And just 7.1% managed to both survive and outperform their average passively managed peer. Now, hold on to that thought for just a moment. Another popular resource is something called the SPIVA scorecard. This is put together by S&P Dow Jones Indices, and this shows how well actively managed mutual funds perform versus their benchmark indexes. So a little bit different than the Morningstar report, but same basic concept here. The findings are mostly the same. For example, in the September SPIVA scorecard, they found that over a 15-year time horizon, 93% of large cap managers failed to outperform on a relative basis. All right, so, so let's take a pause here. None of this, I think, comes as a real big surprise, right? It's been beaten into the ground that passive funds typically beat active funds over the long run. So why is this important as it relates to the Morningstar star ratings? This is the key. And, and, you know, you may hear these stats and say, you know, Nate, that's great. I agree that passive generally beats active. So what? I'm just going to go pick the active funds that do outperform. Well, SPIVA also puts together something called the Persistence Scorecard. 
This measures the percentage of active mutual funds that are able to generate consistent outperformance. Consistent's the key word here. And this is the main finding. Only 4.5% of large cap funds, 4.5% of large cap funds maintain top half performance over five consecutive 12 months periods. So let me put this into other words. Less than 5% of large cap funds finish in the top 50% of all funds for five consecutive years. And it's basically the same story across uh, all the other fund categories. So, Connor, to me, that in a nutshell is the challenge with the Morningstar ratings. There's no consistency to, to uh, performance. You can't rate this stuff. Right. If, if you go to a five-star hotel room, it's going to look about the exact same every time you go, right? Or you, you're a regular business traveler and you go to the same hotel in the same city. That room is going to look identical every time you walk into it. And, fi- you know, ranking systems work in that example, right? Whether it's um, hotels or Yelp reviews or five-star, you know, hotel reviews, whatever, investing doesn't allow for that kind of consistency. And again, Morningstar does a very good job. They are the predom- uh, predominant fund research company in the world. But the issue is that active, actively managed mutual funds and the reality of how hard active performance is, is the underlying issue here. Now, one thing we should be uh, clear about, Morningstar themselves will tell you these star ratings aren't the end-all, be-all. The CEO of Morningstar, Kanal Kapoor, he actually wrote a response to the Wall Street Journal piece because there was so much controversy surrounding this. He said, quote, we've long described the star rating as a worthwhile starting point for research that can help investors make good decisions when combined with other research and tools. He also said, quote, we recognize and have often acknowledged the limitations of a measure like the star ratings that's based on past performance, but we also believe it can usefully tilt the odds in investors' favor. And on that note, tilting the odds in the investors' favor, the Wall Street Journal's own data did show that five-star funds outperform four-star funds, which outperform three-star funds and, and so on. And Morningstar's head of global manager research, Jeffrey Patak, he actually reiterated this on uh, CNBC last week. Take a listen to this. We strongly disagree with their conclusions. If you take a look at some of the findings that they themselves reported in an exhibit to the study, what you find is that highly rated funds, five-star funds, are about seven times more likely to succeed than low-rated funds, one-star funds, over a future 10-year horizon. To me, that doesn't look like failure. That looks like a measure that's tilting the odds Uh, of success in investors' favor, which is what we're all about when we're publishing ratings or promulgating research of various kinds. So, uh, again, we we strongly disagree with the interpretations that they drew uh, in making their assertions in the piece. And then later in that uh, same interview, Jeffrey had some similar comments to the Morningstar CEO in terms of how the star ratings should be used. Take a listen. This is one of the reasons why we have positioned the star rating as a useful starting point for research and we haven't held it out as predictive because, as you observe, past performance is subject to mean reversion. So we want to make sure that we're educating investors so that they don't make the star rating their sole basis for making a choice. Furthermore, as I mentioned before, we've introduced other measures like the forward-looking analyst rating that they can use in tandem with the star rating to make even better decisions about what are the right funds for them, what they're like, more likely to succeed in over time. So we'll continue to monitor our rating systems make improvements to them just as we have. But we think that the star rating is performing as we would expect a useful starting point for research to do. Connor, from my perspective, I think the main problem here is just that there's a disconnect between how investors view the star ratings and and then how useful they actually are. The data is just not as overwhelming as what investors would expect. Uh, Plus, I would point out that a five-star fund should have a better chance than a one-star fund because One-star funds don't attract investor dollars, as you pointed out earlier. They die. They go away. And along with that, you know, what's the saying? If you torture the data long enough, you can make it confess to anything. I I think there's a little bit of that going on here as well. But the bottom line is past performance tells you nothing about what performance may be moving forward. And that's that's the crux of the problem, Nate. You're right. It's how Morningstar views this this rating system versus how the consumer use this rating system. And Morningstar has all these disclosures that this is the first step, blah, blah, blah. But that's not how consumers view it. When you get on Amazon, it's so much easier to just 
look at the average rating of whatever you want to buy instead of doing your own research, and especially if you're buying some you know small knickknack thing. It's a piece of cake to get on there. Boom. Okay, most people like this product, four and a half stars. I'll buy it. And that's unfortunately how a lot of investors treat this Morningstar rating system is, well, this is the best research company in the world. If they give this fund five stars, then undoubtedly I should own it. And that's not the case. Your investments need to be tre- treated differently. You have to do the work yourself. And to their credit, Morningstar is saying this, but that's not how most investors and, frankly, advisors are using this fund rating, uh, this fund rating system. And that's another whole different issue. But uh, the amount of times that, that I see other advisors basically using this Morningstar rating system as, as their crutch or main sales piece is pretty shocking. And then it's very easy to then throw Morningstar under the bus if some of their five-star funds underperform. And that, again, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but not only are the end investors over-relying on this ranking system, so are some advisors. Yeah, you know, it's one thing if you're buying a knickknack on Amazon and you see that it's four or five-star rated and, you know, you spend 100 bucks. It's another thing if you're looking at a Morningstar fund rating and basing your retirement right. on it. Uh, different story. But, look, again, what all this comes down to is nobody has a crystal ball. Are there better mutual fund managers out there than others? No question about it. The problem is bad managers end up going away, right? They don't survive. And new managers who come in and maybe are pretty good, well, they're competing with each other and the existing managers. So what you end up with is managers who may outperform, uh, as Jeffrey Patak said in that clip, they revert to the mean, right? They get challenged by other good managers, and around and around we go. It's like if the Dodgers, Cubs, Astros, and Yankees were the only teams in baseball. They're all really good, but they would beat up on each other over time, right? And so they'd probably end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, Plus, on the opposite side of of the one-star funds dying, I I, I again want to point out, like you were saying at the top of the show, Connor, funds that perform well and they get that coveted five-star rating, well, then they attract money. And as they get bigger, it becomes much harder to outperform because there are only so many good investment ideas out there, right? So the performance can suffer. Like you said, maybe you start off with your 50 best investment ideas. A bunch of money flows into the fund because you got a five-star rating. So if you're that mutual fund manager, you have to deploy that cash. And now maybe you expand to your 80 or 100 best investment ideas. But, you know, that additional 30 to 50 investment ideas aren't maybe going to be as good right. as your first 50. And that's the problem. But... We could do an entire show on these issues, but again, what this all boils down to is it's extremely hard for mutual fund managers to maintain consistent outperformance. And I think any shortcomings of the Morningstar star rating system are simply a reflection of that. I want to expand a little bit on your baseball example there, Nate. The best teams in the world only win 60% of their baseball games, right? It is very rare for teams to win over 100 games and... Uh, since we're in the middle of the World Series, the the Dodgers and Astros, I believe it's been decades since two 100-game winners are actually playing each other in the World Series. It's really rare, and that's only to win 60% of your games. And the reason is they're playing against the very best baseball players in the world. It's hard to win consistently, and I think that analogy holds true to investing. Fund managers are going against the best and brightest other fund managers, pension managers, right, institutional fund managers, it is hard to win more consistently than you lose. And then you add in the challenges that are inherent to actively manage mutual funds, higher expenses, investors constantly adding money to your fund and taking money out of your fund, which can force you to buy and sell when you don't want to, capital gain distributions. It's it's no wonder that it's pretty much impossible to predict outperformance by actively managed mutual funds. Well, we need to take a a break here. We are running way long, uh, but you mentioned higher expenses for actively managed mutual funds. You know what Morningstar did find that had predictive value in fund performance? I have one guess. Cost! Uh, Russ Cannell, who is the director of mutual fund research at Morningstar, he conducted some really in-depth research on this topic, and he found that a fund's expense ratio was the most proven predictor of future returns. And, you know, that makes sense if you think about it, right? Because managers will outperform, managers will underperform. But over time, what's the biggest difference? Their fees. And if you go back to the Morningstar Active Passive Barometer report I mentioned earlier, they found, quote, 
investors would greatly improve their odds of success by favoring low-cost funds, which succeeded far more often than high-cost funds over the long term. Now, we should mention cost is something Morningstar considers when they put together their star rankings. But uh, obviously, you can much more easily cut to the chase by just looking at a fund's expense ratio. So look, we should again note, Morningstar themselves has said their star ratings are backward looking. And uh, they've actually come out with another rating system that's designed to be more forward looking. Uh, I think Jeffrey Batak mentioned uh, that in the uh, CNBC clip I played earlier. They call it their analyst ratings. These are more qualitatively focused. They use metals, so gold, silver, or bronze, and then they have a neutral or negative uh, rating. Now, the Wall Street Journal reached a similar conclusion with those ratings. They looked at those as well. They found that they largely weren't predictive, that higher-rated funds perform somewhat better, but not substantially. Of course, Morningstar disputed how the journal went about analyzing those ratings as well. Let's pull this all together. This is the bottom line. If you want to use these types of ratings as a starting point for your fund research, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not where I would start, but I don't think there's anything wrong with starting starting with those ratings. But if you're relying heavily on these ratings, I do think that's clearly a mistake. And I have to mention, you can just avoid all of this by using low-cost index funds and ETFs, right? You'll get the performance of the market, less a small fee. We like Morningstar. We've said that. This was not meant to be a a bash piece on Morningstar. We use their research at our firm. We wanted to take a balanced look at this topic. But, you know, regarding their their star ranking system, the question we're trying to address is should they still even use them? Because the problem is the gap between what Morningstar says they should be used for and how they are used by the end consumer and advisors and, most importantly, how they're used by – the mutual fund companies that get these rankings because that is the real crux of the problem is these mutual fund companies love marketing their funds that get those five stars from Morningstar. And as as I mentioned earlier, as consumers, we're wired to be attracted to something that's ranked five stars (laughs) instead of one or two. But the reality is Morningstar is trying to quantify something that is almost impossible to quantify which is the future performance of actively managed mutual funds. And unfortunately, I do think this star ranking system isn't helping the end investor like Morningstar thinks they are. All right, with that, let's uh, go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll have a very quick market update. And we'll then be joined by Stephen Schoenfeld, who will spotlight the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Let's go right to our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. More record highs for stocks last week. The S&P 500 was up about a quarter of a percent. The Dow Jones was up nearly a half of a percent. And the NASDAQ gained 1.7% for the week. Uh, The NASDAQ was driven largely by blowout earnings from tech giants Amazon, Alphabet, and uh, Microsoft. And, Connor, the strong earnings we're seeing aren't just limited to tech. Through last Friday, according to FactSet, 55% of the companies in the S&P 500 had reported earnings, and 76% had beaten estimates. And I think you add to that that we had a pretty good GDP number last week, 3% despite the hurricanes. Inflation still appears to be in check. Uh, There's absolutely no volatility You know, if you think about it, it's a pretty good time to be an investor right now. It seems like the biggest uncertainty uh, just surrounds Washington, right? Who Trump will select for the Fed chair, uh, the potential tax reform bill, and, of course, uh, this Robert Mueller investigation. But uh, all in all, the market seems to be firing on all cylinders right now. There is no doubt about that. We're talking about positive returns, historically low volatility, and earnings season is off to a good start with a couple of huge names like Facebook and and Apple announcing uh, later this week. So the question, Nate, is, you know, what are we discussing right now um, with our clients in in this type of market? And what really is going on uh, with most of my client meetings is almost like an annual physical or checkup with your doctor. We're making sure that rebalancing is keeping the overall risk um, the, the equity exposure at levels we want that are longer-term 
appetite for risk is, is still where it needs to be and still that fits the overall a- asset allocation and that matches our goals. These discussions and any potential changes to your investment approach as an investor needs to occur now when things are calm and the markets are moving in the right direction. These are not decisions you want to make in the midst of or after the market has already experienced a correction. Those are going to be almost undoubtedly emotional decisions, which isn't something that results in long-term success. So by all means, enjoy these returns. We're certainly in a very positive market environment right now, but don't be complacent. Make sure you're doing the you know quote-unquote checkup on your portfolio while the water is still calm and not making those types of decisions in the midst of a 10, 15, 20% pullback in equities because then emotions are are almost certainly going to enter the picture, which is never a good thing for an investor. You know, that's a really important point. And I think sometimes when when we're in a bull market like, like we've been in and you see the headlines about, you know, don't become complacent, don't fall asleep at the wheel, uh, the thought is immediately, well, you, you have to be sitting with your finger on the trigger, you, you know, to sell stocks. And that's not the way we view it. What what we're saying in terms of not being complacent is now is the perfect time, to your point, Connor, to rebalance if your portfolio is a little out of whack because stocks have run ahead. Now is the perfect time to reevaluate, reevaluate your investment goals. Right. Uh, are, are you still pursuing the same goals? Have things changed at all? You want to look at your asset allocation, your time horizon, all of these things. Now is the time to do it because at some point – Uh, It's going to happen. The market is going to go down, and it's going to go down significantly. That's not the time to be doing these sorts of activities. So when you hear don't be complacent, don't think that means that, you know, the bottom's going to fall out of the market and you better be ready to to sell. That's not what it means. It means uh, just make sure that uh, while things are calm and and there's no choppy waters, that uh, everything that you're doing with your investments and financially is on track to meet those longer-term goals. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Stephen Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes. We'll spotlight the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show, Nature Racing, Connor Kelly in studio. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 2,000 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Blue Star TA Big E-Tech Israel Technology ETF, ticker symbol ITEQ ITEC. And joining us via phone from New York to discuss this ETF is Stephen Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes. Uh, Stephen, great to have you back on the program. Uh, great to be here, Nate. All right, Stephen, first, I just have to ask you, I saw last week you rang the opening bell on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, that's something that's on my life's to-dos. It's on my bucket list. Uh, how was that experience? Have you rang the uh, opening bell before? Um, yeah, I, I was part of the team at uh, iShares that launched some of the first iShares, and I also helped launch Northern Trust's first family of ETFs. So I had the privilege of ringing the bell at NASDAQ and what used to be the Amex and has been merged into the NYSE. But there's nothing like the big board, and there's nothing like doing it for your own ETF. Um, we built uh, the Blue Star Indexes to be the best indexes and benchmarks for Israeli equities trading worldwide. And to see uh, the ETF that tracks our tech index um, with its ticker symbol all over the floor and with the Israeli flag uh, flying proudly on the corner of Wall and Broad, um, yep, it's a bucket list experience, that's for sure. What was the specific occasion last week? So we um, we initially launched iTech on the NASDAQ uh, two years ago, almost exactly. And as you know, it's very competitive between the exchanges. There's three exchanges competing for ETF um, business. And uh, we already had the ISRA, ISRA ETF, which were partnered with Vanek on trading on the NYSE. And, you know, the NYSE has not only been – uh, very aggressive about protecting their ETF franchise. They have the most ETF listings, but they've really grown in prominence in, in getting tech IPOs and tech listings. And 
with Israel's vibrant tech ecosystem, um, they feel strongly that it's time for the Israeli um, VC and entrepreneur and tech ecosystem to think of NYSE for uh, Israeli tech companies, and they view iTech being on the big board together with ISRA as part of their calling card. So we're expecting a lot of support for these two ETFs as well as um, working with all, you know, all levels of the exchange to, to raise the visibility uh, of the NYSC in Israel. Um, and, you know, our indexes are also used by Israeli investors, so it, it's real important. 130 million plus people watch that bell ringing, and it was seen not only all over the U.S. and Canada, but also in Israel, and, and that's an important part of, uh, of our branding. Stephen, you mentioned Israel's vibrant tech ecosystem, and I've seen the Blue Star Israel Tech ETF referred to as the Startup Nation ETF because Israel has more startups per capita than any other nation, and they do have an extremely robust technology ecosystem. I think that may surprise some investors. So set the stage for us here. Why is Israel such a hub of innovation? Um, so you are correct. Israel um, has the, the most vibrant tech ecosystem in the world after Silicon Valley, bar none. And on a per capita basis, it's, it's punching way above its weight. It's a country the size of New Jersey and a population of less than 9 million. But there, there's a number of unique factors that have helped uh, so many great companies get started in Israel and then move into the world, uh, whether it's in the fields of uh, hardware, software, cybersecurity, uh, 3D printing, biotech, and we'll talk about some of these other uh, areas as well, hopefully. Um, Israeli companies are in the lead. Some of it has to do with the culture of Israel itself. Israel is truly a startup nation. Uh, it's not even, it's turning 70 years old next spring. It was built out of nothing in, uh, in what was swampland and desert and filled with immigrants, just like America. And, and that is a vibrant entrepreneurial foundation. Upon that, think of a great educational system, uh, very high quality, well-educated immigrants from all over the world, especially a major wave from the former Soviet Union in the early 90s, people with, you know, two advanced degrees, um, and wise government policies, tax incentives for early stage investment, uh, some incubators early on. And now, 20 years after Israeli uh, tech uh, started really developing, you have serial entrepreneurs, people who've started one company or made it up the ranks of one company and wanted to start their own, and many of those are in our index. Um, what many people forget, though, is that it's not just startups. It's startups that have grown up. It's companies like um, Amdocs, like Checkpoint, like Stratasys, and I'll name a few more uh, that are prominent in our index. And these are companies now operating around the world, locally, um, in you know, really unique areas, and most of these companies are not in the major tech indexes or tech ETFs that investors are familiar with in the U.S. Uh, we could go into why, but just as an example, QQQ and QTech only has one Israeli tech company, Checkpoint. Uh, the S&P Global Technology ETF, I IXN, has exactly zero because Israel's not in the index. Um, and even small cap tech ETFs only have three, four, five Israeli companies. And so we think is investors are really missing out on this incredible opportunity, which is why we're, we built our index and we're, we're proud that the iTech ETF is trading on the NYSC. Well, Stephen, let's get into some more of the details of the index and the ETF. Walk us through exactly what iTech holds and uh, how sure. it's constructed. Yep. So iTech's benchmark is, as you mentioned, the TA Biggie Tech Index. The TA stands for Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. They are a partner with us in this index, and we're proud of that. It's the first, in, it's the first global index that, for Israeli companies that they have partnered with anyone in. Uh, it has 70 stocks, so it's quite broad. It goes well beyond traditional tech of hardware and software. It includes a lot of cutting-edge disruptive technologies, um, cybersecurity, Internet of Things, uh, high-speed networking, um, 3D printing, biotech, and biopharma. And so if you think of any of the, the, the robust tech areas that Israel is well-known for, it has exposure to it. Um, 
By U.S. standards, it would be a, a mid-small cap index, although some of the large companies are quite large. The top uh, five holdings are Checkpoint Software, which not only is a world leader in, in cybersecurity, but it actually coins the term firewall. Um, second largest stock is Amdocs, which is a world leader in um, what initially was cell phone billing, but now it's basically think of all the optimization of data on people's smartphones. So they are the world leader, and they partner with all the major uh, telecoms companies. Um, nice Systems, which is a world leader in what is called actionable intelligence. Think of perimeter security, cameras, and voice detection, and that then has to be analyzed. Um, they protected the Rio Olympics. I'm sure, unfortunately, they're going to be very busy in the next few years after tragedies we've had in Europe with terrorism, the shooting in Las Vegas. It's their technology that's, that's quite adept at protecting um, areas. Um, Elbit Systems is one of Israel's leading defense and cyber security companies. Their U.S. subsidiary provides the smart helmets for uh, the F-22 and the F-35 fighter. Their uh, unmanned uh, vehicles, initially it was UAVs, but now they have um, unmanned boats, unmanned uh, uh, cars or Jeeps, uh, are very critical to modern warfare. Um, and Tower Semiconductor, which is uh, one of the leading uh, semiconductor companies and also fabricators. Uh, so those are the top five in the index. Uh, other companies that people might have heard of are Wix.com, which is the world leader in uh, do-it-yourself websites, uh, and Ormat Technologies, uh, which is the world leader in geothermal energy, even though Israel has no geothermal energy. But they're active in Nevada, and they're active in Mexico, and they're active in Chile, and um, this is really part of the story. Israel's a small country, so most of, the, most of their companies operate globally. Our guest today is Stephen Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes. We're spotlighting the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF, ticker symbol ITEQ. Uh, Stephen, I, actually yesterday I was looking at the performance of this ETF, and it's been extremely strong this year. It's up around 30% through last Friday. I'm curious, what have been some of the primary drivers of this performance? So we're, we're, we're real impressed at the breadth of the performance of um, iTech's benchmark, the TA Biggie Tech. Um, one driver earlier this year was the acquisition by Intel of Mobileye, which is the world leader in autonomous driving. That, that took place in March, so most of that return uh, happened earlier in the year, but it's not the majority of the return for this year. Uh, Checkpoint, which I mentioned, has had a great year. So has Amdocs. Elbit Systems, if you look at the chart, you can see what a strong performer um, it is. Wix.com, even though it's got pretty high valuation, it continues to deliver with its earnings, and it's had a terrific year. Uh, Ormat, which I mentioned, uh, is uh, close to record highs as it develops its business. It also it had a... Uh, strategic investor uh, from Japan put a significant amount into the company. Um, so it's quite broad-based. The one area of uh, underperformance has been um, 3D printing. Uh, it now seems to be coming back a little bit. So the, the, the main 3D printing stock in the index is Stratasys. Any thoughts on valuations at all, just generally speaking? You know, here in the U.S., stocks obviously continue to set new record highs, but there does seem to be uh, some concern regarding high valuations. What's your take on the overall valuations of the stocks included in iTech? So um, Israeli tech is not cheap by, um, you know, by global standards. Uh, people do pay for the kind of earnings uh, and the growth of earnings that Israeli companies have been delivering. Um, but um, what we feel, aside from the fact that we think these companies are going to continue to grow, is we see a secular, a secular shift. We see American and global investors discovering Israeli tech, seeing how prominent Israeli tech companies are in driving the next wave of disruptive technology, and we think there will be a discovery effect as investors recognize this. But even more important, Israeli domestic investors, institutional investors, insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds, have been underinvested in their own tech boom. It's ironic, but because so many of these companies, the vast majority, are not listed in Tel Aviv. They're listed on NASDAQ and NYSC and London and even Australia and Singapore. They're not in the local benchmark index. 
And this has hurt the relative performance of local investors. They've seen Israeli tech booming this year, while the local index is only up about 5%. And we're seeing a shift. I was just in Israel earlier this month. My colleague, our director of research, is going in a couple of months, and we, we have um, one staff there. And we're seeing these big institutions um, really recognizing what they're missing out. And the government is also encouraging the launch of some dedicated tech funds, which are um, – are going to be launched early next year. So we think there's going to be a discovery effect and an allocation effect as well. Now, Stephen, just to be clear, Israel is considered a developed market, correct? Because I think that, given its location in the Middle East, some people may perceive it as more of an emerging market economy. Yeah, so Israel is, is one of the, um, the success stories and actually graduated from being an emerging market to a developed market in uh, 2009 by FTSE and 2010 by MSCI. Um, the only other countries that did that were Portugal in 1998 uh, and Greece in 2001, but Greece was then demoted. So Israel is solidly in the developed market uh, camp. Its economy uh, is very strong. It's actually one of the best performers in developed markets. It's got probably the most positive demographics of any developed market country as well. People talk about the graying uh, of uh, Europe and the graying of Japan. Israel has a young and growing population. Uh, the, the average uh, family is having two and a half kids, not the one and a half that we have in, the, in, in other developed markets. Very high quality immigration. And so it's really a gem out there that is not fully discovered from its macroeconomic story, too, which is why um, we think investors should also consider the broad-based uh, ETF that tracks our broad-based Israel index, and that, I mentioned before, is ISRA, or ISRA, uh, also listed on the NYSE. Stephen, we only have about two minutes left here. Given Israel's location, obviously it's located in an extremely volatile area, if my geography is correct. It borders uh, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, obviously Palestine. Should that be of concern to investors just from a risk standpoint? So that's probably the question we get asked the most. And um, the short answer is, based on past history during geopolitical events, uh, the answer is no. Uh, we track our indexes go back more than 15 years. We, we have charts that show how Israel performs when there's local tension, whether it's an attack on Israel by Hamas terrorists in Gaza or Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the market gets a little bit shaken but it tends to dust itself off and, and continue on. And that's partly because of those Israeli domestic investors that I mentioned. They don't get scared when the foreigners get a little scared. They actually step in and scoop up. Where Israel has exposure is it's part of the global economy. So when uh, tech uh, gets some flutters, Israeli tech companies will, of course, uh, rise in volatility. Uh, if Europe or the U.S., goes into recession, that will affect the broader Israeli economy. So um, the other part of the equation, though, well, there's two more, quickly. One, Israel's uh, world-class defense industry and innovation in defending itself has been a major spur to its tech innovation. I don't have time, but many of the companies in our index, uh, some of their technology was initially developed for or by the Israel Defense Forces, and some of their leadership were serious uh, generals and lieutenants who sort of were uh, forged by fire. But second of all, beneath the surface of the tension we read about every day, um, the, there is quiet development in Israel's ties toward uh, the moderate Arab Sunni states, uh, including the Gulf. And I think uh, not this year, probably not next year, but before the end of the decade, we'll see some real interesting developments in Israel's economy and its uh, cooperation with some of its neighbors, and we think that's going to create another boost to Israel's economy and certainly toward its tech ecosystem, which, um, you know, global companies know they need to be a part of, and we hope global investors will now recognize that as well. Well, Stephen, with that, we'll have to leave it there. We're about out of time. Excellent spotlight today. Just a fascinating area of the market. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, and happy Halloween to everyone. That was Stephen Schoenfeld, founder and chief investment officer of Blue Star Indexes. The ETF is the Blue Star Israel Technology ETF, ticker symbol ITEQ. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting ITEQETF.com. 
Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, another great guest for you. Meb Faber, founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management, will join us to spotlight the Cambria Global Value ETF and the Cambria Tail Risk ETF. And we'll also talk global stock valuations. Until then... Have a great week, everyone.